This is Richard Dawkins, the best-known atheist in the Western world and author of worldwide bestseller The God Delusion. I'm pretty hostile to organised religion. I'm pretty hostile to religion where it is thrust down people's throats. Recently, Dawkins stepped down from his academic post at Oxford University, but he remains an acute social observer and a trenchant critic of religious privilege. In fact, his retirement appears to be anything but, allowing him to devote himself more completely to championing atheism. I'm a scientist. I, I'm fascinated by what's true about the universe and I resent the importation of a worldview which I regard as false, but which is immensely influential, especially on children. I very, very strongly resent the indoctrination of children uh, with a belief system which is not substantiated by any facts, and particularly children are not being taught to think for themselves they're being taught, this is what you believe because you are a Christian child. This is what you believe because you are a Muslim child. I resent the labelling of children as Christian children or Muslim children. Children should be allowed to grow up, to think for themselves and decide their own opinions. A lot of people would argue that religion is beneficial. Otherwise, why would it have survived for so many millennia? The fact that something survived for millennia is very far from demonstrating that it's beneficial. Uh, the influenza virus, I mean, <laughs> cancer survived for millennia, that, that plenty of things survive for, for millennia and, they're, and they're, not, uh, they're not beneficial. It is true that some very good people happen to be religious and some very bad people happen to be religious. Some good people happen to be atheists and some bad people happen to be atheists. The interesting question is whether being religious makes you more likely to be good or being atheist makes you more likely to be good. I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that there is a logical progression that leads from being religious to doing very bad things, but believing you're doing good things. There are plenty of people who do really terrible things, not plenty, enough, a minority of people, who do really terribly bad things. I'm thinking of the hijackers of 9-11, for example, any of the suicide bombers. These are people who fervently and sincerely believe they're doing the righteous good thing. They're not evil people. They believe they're doing the right thing. They believe that that's what their God wants them to do. So there is a logical progression that says, because of my religion, I'm going to do this thing, which I regard as good, everybody else regards as terrible. I don't believe there is such a logical progression that says, because I'm an atheist, I'm going to do this thing. And is the difficulty with those people, in your view, the fact that they are not actually open to the persuasions of reason? Is that the problem? I think it is the problem. I think it stems from early childhood indoctrination. They are so absolutely convinced that their God is the only God, that, that, that therefore the cause of that God is the righteous cause, that nothing is too terrible. Killing people is okay, because that's what God wants you to do. That sort of attitude is, as you say, not open to rational persuasion, or it's very hard to counteract it by rational persuasion. We showed Richard Dawkins a copy of the Compass Atheists program screened in Australia, and he viewed it before agreeing to give this interview. In his book, Dawkins proposed a spectrum for rating people in a range from religious believers to non-believers. So I began by asking him where on his spectrum he would put the contributors to the Atheists program. I developed this scheme of one to seven. One is absolutely convinced there's a God. Seven is absolutely convinced there's no God. I would have thought that most of the contributors would be kind of six and a half, like me. I would place myself as agnostic on the extreme end towards atheism. I need to qualify what I mean by saying agnostic because people often take agnostic to mean you just don't know. I mean, it could be either, could be a god, maybe there's no god. 50-50. I'm definitely not that. I'm a kind of 99% against. But it would be irrational to say I'm absolutely positive that there's no god. I wouldn't say that I'm absolutely positive there are no fairies. So my position about god is the same as my position about fairies. In the Compass program, The Atheists, we've um, put the proposition that 
atheists assumed over the past century that religion would die out as science advanced and that in fact that hasn't happened and that atheists are alarmed about this. Is that an accurate portrayal of the position of atheists? I can't speak for anybody else, speaking for myself. I am alarmed. I think I'm more generally alarmed, though, at a sort of um, willful ignorance of science. And if you look at the number of people who believe that the world is only 6,000 years old, which they get from scripture, it is alarmingly high in America, in Britain, I would guess in Australia, but I'm not sure about that. Um, and you put that into perspective, if you ask other questions about ignorance of science, I mean, that is lamentable ignorance of science, no question about it. But if you ask people, for example, um, how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the Sun, I think it's 19% of the British people in one recent poll think that it takes one month for the Earth to orbit the Sun. I think it was 27% of people in Britain think that early humans walked with dinosaurs. So I put the creationist problem in perspective of a terrible ignorance of science, um, which may be almost a hostility to, to science. I'm not really sure whether it's a particular problem of religion or whether it's a general problem of just plain ignorance. And would you agree that religious people and religious movements are becoming more activist politically and otherwise? Undoubtedly, in the United States over the last two, um, eight years, uh, in the Bush years, we have had a terrible resurgence of uh, religious, political activism and seizing power. Religions are enormously powerful. I mean, in, in Britain, um, we will be still, well, in a sense, a technically th a theocracy because we have an established church, we have bishops in the House of Lords, the Queen is the head of the Church of England. but. As you said in the programme, church going is is declining in Britain. So you might think that there wasn't uh, there wasn't too much of a problem. On the other hand, uh, religious people do seem to have a kind of free pass into discussions, into not just in the House of Lords but in television debates, any sort of parliamentary committees, any sort of royal commissions on anything to do with morals. You tend to get representative not of just one religion but of several different religions. Uh, religious organizations automatically can get charitable status, almost no questions asked. If you can say that you're a religion, right, that's it, you have charitable status, you don't pay any taxes. Uh, whereas if you're a non-religious charity, you have to jump through any number of hoops in order to get charitable status. I know this because I've just started a charity myself. It took me nearly two years to to get it through, and I had to answer questions like, kindly inform us how science benefits humanity. A religious organisation doesn't even have to ask the parallel question. And what are the harms or the problems that you see from religion having a place at the table, such an assured place at the table of um, our social institutions? On those moral questions like abortion, stem cell research, um, they bring their bigoted views and they influence uh, parliament, they, they lobby parliament, they influence public opinion. Scientific research was seriously held back in the United States because of, of religious lobbying. But I'm more interested as a scientist in the subversion of education, the substitution of an alternative world view which has no basis in fact which actually detracts, subtracts, from the beauties of science, which science teachers want to get on with uh, imparting to children. All these new atheists want to, want to convert the world from belief to unbelief. And like uh, Christian missionaries, like Christian evangelists, they believe that if they can alter human beliefs on a, on a large scale, then the world will be better. In fact, we have plenty of historical evidence from the Soviet Union and elsewhere that when attempts are made to eradicate religion, to eliminate religion from human life, to deconvert people from religious belief to some other type of belief or of unbelief, the results are generally pretty disastrous. Your books have prompted a lot of debate 
how do you respond to the claims that evangelical atheists are doing more harm than good? I disown the phrase evangelical atheist because evangelical people are those who have a holy book and to proselytize from that holy book. We have no holy book. We're simply asking people to think for themselves. And uh, my belief is that if you really do think for yourself objectively and look at the evidence, you will find that there is no good evidence for any kind of religious belief. Now, um, that's not uh, evangelizing. That is simply saying, think for yourself. If it were true that asking people to think for themselves was counterproductive, then I'm sorry, but I'm not going to restrain myself from saying, please, think for yourself. I'm not saying you must believe X, Y, and Z. I'm saying I'm not in a position to tell you what you should believe, and nor is anybody else. You should think it out for yourself. Here's the evidence. I can help you to find the evidence. Here are these books. Here are these libraries. Go into the library. Read it up for yourself. Think for yourself. Come to your own opinion. But is it futile um, to try to persuade people who are effectively brainwashed to have strong psychological, not rational reasons, but irrational reasons for holding on to their beliefs. If it's futile, then that's unfortunate, but I don't think it's a reason for not even trying. I think it would be defeatist and rather cowardly just to say, oh, it's futile, and rather actually, um, well, almost condescending, um, almost contemptuous to say, you're too stupid for me to argue with you. I would never wish to say that. Dawkins has been remarkably successful in mobilising atheists. Recently, he agreed to help raise £10,000 for advertising atheism. And £150,000 poured in. Now there are snappy ads in the streets of London, cheerfully promoting godlessness. He remains a target for media attacks, yet he refuses to stay out of the public arena. The day before our interview, he launched the first national student body for young British atheists. Have your books and your, you know, the public debates that you've participated in, do you think that they've encouraged what we could call closet atheists to come out and to speak up and say, well, actually, I am an atheist or I don't think there's a God? That's my great hope. I, I don't actually think that I and my colleagues uh, have really succeeded very much in convincing really um, complete dyed-in-the-wool um, theists. What I do think we've done is, exactly as you say, encourage people to come out of the closet. I think we've encouraged people who either have been kind of secret atheists, and in America there are a lot of those. In Britain and I think Australia, that's not a problem because you don't have to hide it, but in America you do. The problem with the word atheism is that it has become very pejorative in America. I mean, you might as well call yourself a child molester or a, or a rapist or something, I mean, a communist. I mean, it, that, that's how atheists are treated, which is why the new atheist movement is a, something of a political social move. It's our way of saying, hey, look, we're not going to put up with that anymore. Then there are people who didn't really realize they were atheists, but sort of now that it's brought to their attention, now that they see the arguments laid out, they say, yeah, that's right. That's what I've always thought. I just never articulated it. So I think there's a lot of that. And, and I get moving, overwhelming evidence of that when I go around, especially in America, giving lectures. And people come up to me afterwards and say exactly that, 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 that you've given me a voice. This, you and your colleagues, Sam Harrison, Christopher Hitchens, etc., have given, have given us a voice. I didn't realize there were people who thought like me. I didn't realize that I was going to be surrounded in a hall of a thousand people who all apparently think like me, and I thought I was on my own. I get a lot of that. Atheists are very diverse we discovered when we came to look at them in our program. Would you agree with the idea that science is the touchstone that they all have in common, that all atheists have in common, a love of science? I think a great many atheists do have a love of science. I think a, 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 there's another set of them who are reacting against the common assumption that you need to be religious in order to be moral. I mean, my main interest is science, but there are many other atheists whose main interest is ethics. And they are really, I think, affronted by the view that they, as atheists, cannot be moral people, because they very often are extremely moral people. And they quite rightly take umbrage, take exception at the 
actually preposterous view that you need religion in order to be moral. <laughs> In our Compass program, the atheists, um, Philip Adams, John Gray and Mike Shermer, argue that it's going to be necessary to cooperate with religious people of goodwill to offset the effects of, say, climate change. Um, so I guess my question is, is, do you think they're right? Will we need to suspend hostilities between religious and secular people to save the planet, to save ourselves? There's always a, a case for political expediency. Um, politics is the art of the possible. And so uh, you're trying to get something done, save the planet, save the Amazon rainforest, um, stop global warming. Of course, we've got to um, cooperate with people of goodwill. I mean, even in the, in the field of my own field of evolution education, I cooperate regularly with bishops uh, to try to stop the, uh, the infiltration of creationism into, into British schools. So yes, I, I, there, there are arguments of political expediency, and I see the force of them. Is there anything to fear in a universe that's empty of a sky god? Well, I find it an extraordinary idea that because we have ex existential loneliness, that somehow that affects what's true. I mean, either there is a god or there isn't. And the fact that it, there, if there isn't one, it makes you feel lonely. Well, tough. I mean, what's, what's that got to do with anything? Either it's true or it's not true. Let's stand up and face up to the truth. Now, I don't feel existentially lonely, or if I do, it's rather an agreeable feeling. It's a feeling of, of looking out at the stars and, and thinking, you know, maybe this planet here is the only place where there's life. We don't know that, but maybe it is. In a way, that's a grand feeling. It's a, it's a magnificent feeling, far more poetically moving, I think, than the pokey little feeling that this is all there is, is th this, this world here is, all, is all, all there is, and that somehow it's all there for the benefit of humanity, and animals were put here for the benefit of humanity and things. I'd far rather face up to the truth, and if it makes you feel a bit, a bit lonely, that's tough, but the truth is bracing. During our visit, we learned that Dawkins had just finished a new book to be published in the UK in September 2009. The title is The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. It's about the evidence for evolution. Its subject, evolution, harks back to that of The Selfish Gene, the first book to bring Richard Dawkins to prominence. In the year of Darwin's birth, in the 150th anniversary year of The Origin of Species, um, it, it did seem like a, a good idea. I've written plenty of books about evolution before, but never actually laid out the evidence for it. I have enormous regard for, for Darwin. He was a great scientist. He, when you open any of his books, but say especially The Origin of Species, you get an immediate feeling that he's really struggling to, to convey his meaning. There's no side he's not showing off, he's not trying to bamboozle you. He really, really wants you to understand. He lays out the evidence as clearly as he possibly can. He was a very gentle man he was a very a great intellectual. He was devoted to his work, to, to science, to truth, um, and to his family. He was a very a great um, family man. Um, an utterly admirable character, in, I think, in all ways. He started off as a religious person, not very strongly. He was destined for the church. He was training for the church when he was at Cambridge. He gradually lost his faith. I think he was tortured, perhaps, by his wife's faith, because he didn't want to upset her and tortured by the feeling that he might upset a whole lot of other people. But he nevertheless, he had to have a substantial amount of courage to come out and to stand by his theory in the face of what he may have well anticipated was going to be an enormous amount of controversy and opposition. He did anticipate that, and he certainly thought he needed a lot of courage. Um, he'd actually delayed for about 15 years, which is not a terribly courageous thing to do, um, although he did plenty of other things during that, during that time. Um, I think a better way to put it is that he was amassing this mountain of evidence. He wanted to get all the evidence in place uh, before going into print, rather than rushing into print when he first had the idea, which was about 15 years earlier. And finally, do you think that you might be visiting Australia again? Well, I'm hoping to come this year, but, I, but I'm not absolutely, you know, my plans aren't firmed up yet, and, and, uh, but I would very much like to come to Australia. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you.